We start. Good morning, or good afternoon, actually, to everybody. Hi, welcome um, to the session organised by the Academy of Medical Cannabis. Um, I'm Mike Barnes. I'm the Director of Education at the Academy, um, amongst other things. Um, with Medical Cannabis, understanding, prescribing, and changing lives. So what we, it's, uh, if you'd like, a very fairly basic, well, the part I'm going to do, uh, to tell you about the, the basics of the endocannabinoid system and the phytocannabinoids and what it does. I'm aware there are people in the audience who, who know an awful lot about all that, more than me, uh, so, but there are equally some who probably don't know very much at all. Uh, then we're going on to, bear with me, I'll show you what we're doing, uh, to Danny Gordon at uh, half an hour in, who's going to be, who Danny, or well she introduced herself, but she's uh, a doctor from Canada who has prescribed for two or 3,000 uh, people uh, for cannabis and therefore knows much more than I do, and much more than any British doctor does, actually, about how to prescribe and the, the pros and cons of prescribing, what to do and everything else. So no pressure on you to do all that. Then we have a quick break. Where there's no expense spared today. We're going to have water and biscuits <laughs> uh, uh, for you. Uh, you can't bring it back into the lecture theatre, but if you do, no one's going to stop you. Um, I was told absolutely not to say that under any circumstances. That was a mistake. Um, and then Leon, Dr. Leon Barron, who's a GP, uh, is going to tell us from the GP's perspective. And I think that's very important because I think the one mistake we'll come to later uh, that the government made is allowing only specialist doctors to prescribe cannabis. I think they should have opened it up on day one to GPs, who I think will be better, frankly, better and more um, broader, holistic prescribers. Uh, so uh, Leon is involved with the medical cannabis clinics. It's going to tell us a little bit about a GP's perspective on cannabis and the relevance to opioid prescription, which is a not such a problem as the States, but a problem in the UK. And then a quick um, Q&A. It's a lovely day out there, so what we don't want you to do at 1.10 is disappear and not come back again. So we could lock the doors or something, but uh, we'll just a little bit of a break and networking session at 1.10. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Uh, 30 seconds on the Academy, which is the sponsor and organizer of the day. The Academy of Medical Cannabis is a free online uh, teaching program. Uh, there's 12 basic modules, and they are basic. There's no question about that. They're designed for people who know nothing or very little about uh, cannabis medicine. Um, it's they're about 15, 20 minutes a module, and it goes through the whole um, basics, of what, basically what I'm going to talk about in 30 minutes. Um, then there are now some, if you like, drop-down specialist modules. I think there's another 10 on epilepsy pain and such like for more specialist input. And that will be uh, not as relevant necessarily to this audience. That was, is now translated into French and available soon. John in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. What? Now? In what? What is it in? Yeah, what I just said. Good. Um, so we'll roll that out worldwide. We have no limit to our ambitions for the academy. Um, I better stop talking because I've only got half an hour and I've already taken five minutes. Uh, so we'll go through. That's me. So uh, I, the history of cannabis is actually really interesting, and I've only got about two minutes to do it, uh, but the social history of cannabis is fascinating. It is undoubtedly the world's first recorded medicine. So people say this is a new thing, we don't know much about its safety profile and what it does. I'm talking absolute nonsense because it's been around for about 3,000 years, and if it turned people uh, a strange color or their legs dropped off, we would know by now. So uh, even at the health committee recently, People say, well, we don't know about its safety profile. Well, of course we do. There's a million and a half people using it for medical purposes in this country alone every day. We do know about its safety profile. So I've drifted into politics again, haven't I, before <laughs> I've even got going. Um, so where did it start? It started really around, uh, well, parts of China and the Himalayan area, as you can see from the black bit on that slide. Um, it's recorded um, before man uh, in terms of some of the genetics, but started well before Christ over two or 3,000 years ago in the ancient civilizations of China and then India, and then it slowly spread westwards into Africa, across the, across the pond to the States and parts of South America. Much more recently, actually, in terms of its natural, uh, natural growing, uh, if you like, and into Europe in about the 15th, 16th centuries. So it spread slowly west from the origins uh, around the Himalayas. And this is, uh, I always put this slide up because no one yet has challenged me about my interpretation of hieroglyphics. Um, this is Abus papyrus in 1500 BC, and you see that word there, that says cannabis. 
good. Still no one has challenged me. It might, I don't know what the hell it says, actually, but it's, it is meant to say cannabis, and it describes using cannabis poultice, a vaginal suppository for pain, actually, uh, related probably to menstrual pain, and that's still a, a perfectly valid use. So it has a very long history. And I just like this quote. That was all the Scythians enjoy it so much they howl with pleasure. So um, that was the, again, four 500 years BC from however you pronounce that, of Halicarnassus. Hero, hero, I can't say it. Um, anyway, it's, again, it shows its antiquity, if you like. Coming up, this is so fast through history. Uh, but, uh, but perhaps the pioneer, um, in terms of bringing it into Europe, at least, was this guy, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy. I, I, I labeled him as English um, recently and got in an awful lot of trouble as I was talking in, in Ireland at the time, and he was actually Irish. Um, but he did come back to England. He, he was in India. He noticed the, the local people were using uh, hemp, particularly, uh, for treating various ailments. And he brought it back with him and introduced it into the British Isles in what was called then Squire's Extract. And it was a perfectly valid part of medicine for quite a long time in the latter part of the 19th century, early half, really, of the 20th century. And it was very much a, a pillar of the establishment of medicine. Sir William Osler, who's called the father of modern medicine, uh, cannabis indica is the most satisfactory remedy. He was talking about migraines, as it happens. So, you know, it had a, a perfectly established place in the medical panoply of uh, treatment options. And, you know, the, the apocryphal story, of course, is Queen Victoria used it for her menstrual pains as well. And I have no reason to doubt that. So pre-1928, I'll come back by 1928 in a minute, it was widely used for all sorts of remedies in children and adults and perfectly acceptable uh, form of medicine. Then this fellow came along. That's an interesting story in his own right. He was the uh, uh, commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, he was originally in charge of the um, prohibition, and when prohibition was ending, uh, he uh, worried about his budget and his, uh, his officers and thought he'd better have a, 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 a secondary campaign to keep his budget. It was literally that. He was in competition with J. Edgar Hoover, who was the um, commissioner of the federal um, the FBI. Uh, so he invented, and I think that's probably the right word to use, he invented a campaign against marijuana. He labeled it marijuana, which is the Mexican usage of the term from cannabis. Uh, and it was a highly uh, unpleasant um, racist campaign, mainly anti-black and anti-Mexican, uh, about marijuana being uh, the evil uh, uh, in society. And this was purely designed so he kept his budget and kept his job and kept his offices. And that is... Uh, based not in any element of truth at all. But it was such a successful campaign, a lot associated with J. Randolph Hearst, um, in, 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 in cahoots, if you like. Uh, then, and of course, the, the US culture was so by, began to be so widespread, this spread around the world, that marijuana is uh, evil and difficult and anti-establishment and everything else, uh, without any uh, basis of fact. So there are lots of uh, campaigns I like these. Drug peddlers are shrewd, they may put some of this drug in your tea, um, it's all sorts of, maybe still do, I don't know. Um, and the famous Reefer Madness. But I, somebody told me recently this has been re-released um, as a modern version. I haven't seen it. Is that that's right, is it? Um, but this was a famous, a famous film, um, Drug Crazed Abandon. I think it might be more attractive more than put you off it, but anyway. Um, but this was very effective, actually, to be serious, about making uh, marijuana... Uh, perceived as being a bad thing. So, um, 1928 was made illegal in many countries, but actually still prescribable, until quite surprisingly recently, up to the 1970s, um, in this country. Um, in 1961, uh, it became a Schedule One drug in the UN Single Convention on Drugs, and that was put in there as a result of an Egyptian delegate standing up and saying, uh, marijuana, as they still call it in uh, my country, is responsible for a lot of crime and difficulties. I want it uh, categorized along with narcotics, and no one said anything contrary to that, so it was then lumbered in Schedule One uh, of the UN Single Convention on Drugs and stayed there. Again, no evidence behind that statement. Um, the that original statement's lost, I gather, historically, so no one can say what evidence was put behind it, but I don't think there was any. And then the countries who followed the UN had to uh, trans uh, move, make their own misuse of drugs regulations. As a result, it took 10 years for the UK to get around to doing that in the Misuse of Drugs Act and the Misuse of Drugs Regulations in 19, 1971. And from then on, it was illegal for doctors to prescribe it and anyone else to possess it, of course. Okay, very brief history. Um, now, very brief then to cannabinoid system. I've got to do this 
There's another five minutes on another thing that could take several hours to do. But I think uh, to an, it's a useful comment to say that we actually all produce cannabis in our own brains. That's a slight simplistic uh, overview, but uh, a comment, but we do. It may not be known that every animal, except insects, I gather, uh, have endocannabinoid systems. Uh, and these are basically, uh, we have receptors in the brain, cannabinoid receptors, number one and two, possibly three. We're, we're learning about this as we, as we speak almost. Um, and the body produces chemicals that interact with those receptors, called mainly, there's probably others, called anandamide and one I can't pronounce, but it's fortunately called TOAG as well. Um, and these receptors are all over the system. They are uh, predominantly CB1 receptors, are prominently in the brain, but they're also in the immune system, the reproductive system, the gastrointestinal system, the heart, the lung, all over. CB2 receptors are more immune-related. So people wonder, well, cannabis must be some sort of snake oil because it does all sorts of things to all sorts of things. It doesn't just do neurological things. It does bowel and bladder and uh, psychiatric conditions and everything else. Well, the reason it does that is because it interacts with our own body's endocannabinoid system. So it doesn't mean it doesn't do anything, uh, but we're just not used to a compound, a family of medicines that interacts so widely and has such potential huge use from conditions that are apparently unrelated, but they are related in the sense they all have some pathological in interaction with the, our own body's endocannabinoid system. So very briefly, what is our endocannabinoid system? How does it work? This is a sort of slide that puts people immediately to sleep. Um, but if there are those in the audience who understand pre- and post-synaptic neurons and such like, what it does, if I can start at the top very briefly, um, when we um, interact, then a nerve, a signal comes down a nerve and jumps to the next nerve, it crosses the boundary between the two in this synaptic cleft, as it's called, the white bit in the middle. And what transmits that electrical signal are chemicals that cross that barrier. And I'm sure you'll all of some of you be expert in this audience, some won't be. Uh, for dopamine system, for example, is very well known. It's pathologically a fault in Parkinson's disease, for example. But there are many other systems, serotoninergic system, glutamate system, glycine. Whatever it is, is released across the, the boundary, interacts with a, a terminal on the other side and fires the electrical neuron off. That's what it usually does. That system needs modulating. It needs switching off, otherwise it keeps firing. And what switches it off, what modulates it, produces some sort of homeostasis, some sort of stability, is the endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid chemicals, without going through this slide in detail, are released from the postsynaptic terminal there. They go backwards and switch off the signal from the presynaptic terminal. So basically, in a nutshell, far too simplistically in a sense, is the endocannabinoid system modulates, tones down uh, the, the bodies, all the bodies' um, neurological systems, if you like. That's why it has such a wide-ranging effect. What does it do? I mean, this is just a, uh, a random list in a sense, but it, it has a lot of effect on neural functions, has clearly has effect on memory, on control of how we walk, motor control, pain, of course, uh, how nerves are generated, neurogenesis, how they're adapted after damage, neuroplasticity, it has uh, effects on things like uh, temperature regulation, sleep, appetite, social behavior, anxiety. It's a massive range, pretty well everything you can think of. That's in the neural some, some, um, system. You move across to the metabolic energy balances. It's sort of a balancing thing. Energy balance, uh, metabolic balance, homeostasis, effect on the female reproductive system, the stress response, autonomic functions, bladder, gastrointestinal, cancer control has a significant role in cancer control. And that's just a, a very quick one slide of what it can do. So we can see that's the body's natural endocannabinoid system. But what's that got to do with the plant? What it's got to do with the plant is the natural plant has, uh, uh, has more than two main components. I'll come to those in a moment. Two main components, THC and CBD, I'll come to that in a minute. But they, all they do is interact with our body's endocannabinoid system. That's how they work. Um, so they're supplementing, if you like. They're enlarging. They're um, uh, adding to, sometimes taking away from, the body's natural endocannabinoid balance. So some would say that some diseases are, are naturally short of endocannabinoids, endocannabinoid deficient, and all the plant is doing is giving you that back, it, put it very crudely, it's like giving dopamine to correct the deficiency in Parkinson's disease. So it interacts, those, all the components of cannabis interact with our body's own endocannabinoid system. So it's a natural interaction. THC, as we know, is, I don't like the word psychoactive, I've gone off it. 
but it's actually all, everything kind of noise is psychoactive in the sense of it acts on the brain, it has to be psychoactive. It's more uh, perhaps intoxicating is the better effect. So THC is intoxicating, gets you high, where CBD is not intoxicating, it doesn't get you high. Some would even slightly dispute that, but generally that's true. Um, indeed, some seems to counteract, the and the CBD actually counteracts the THC effect. So if you have CBD in your plant or your medicine, you, you generally, depending on the ratio, won't get high because CBD is counteracting the high you get from THC. Generally, uh, the cannabis you might get on the street is very high in THC these days and very low in CBD, which is why it's sold, because you get, it gets you high. Generally speaking, medical cannabis will have a higher proportion of CBD, so it doesn't get you high. Most people with the, with the cannabis as a medicine don't want the high effect. Some do, because it's beneficial to them, but many don't, and that's where you get the you balance the ratio between THC and CBD. There's evidence, and I think pretty conclusive evidence, frankly, that the whole plant is better than individual components. That's a slightly controversial statement, because there are companies that make pure isolates, as they're called, CBD isolate, what we call epidiolex, a THC and CBD isolate just by themselves, just as separate chemicals, and one called Sativex. Uh, but I think there's evidence now that the whole plant is more effective than the individual components, that so-called the entourage effect. Uh, and the whole plant will contain not just THC and CBD, but a load of other cannabinoids and a load of other components, which I'll come to in a moment, called terpenes. And they also have a, a medical effect. So the whole plant is better than the individual components of the plant. I think there's no doubt about that, personally. Where do you get it from? The flowering head has the most phytocannabinoids. Uh, the unfertilized female flower is uh, what you need to harvest to get the most uh, return for your money, if it's were. Uh, there's less uh, cannabinoids in leaves and stems, and generally speaking, none in the seeds and the roots. And that's where they are. That's on the flowering head. Uh, the chemical factories of cannabis, where those, those things called trichomes, so you can see the white dots there, are uh, where the cannabinoids are stored, and that's what you extract uh, when you extract uh, into oil or whatever format you want. That's what you get off. You wouldn't do that if you smoke it, but that's what you would do to extract it to get the cannabinoids out in oil or a capsular form. I don't think it matters too much this slide. There are, t there are three varieties of cannabis actually, uh, but the ones we hear a lot about is sativa on the right, indica on the left, uh, most now are hybrids between the two. And uh, there's meant to be differences between sativa and indica in terms of their effect, and there are differences, but they're probably that's not a component of indica per se, or sativa per se. It's the balance of the cannabinoids within the and terpenes within the plant that determines their effect. The very, very crudely, sativa is more uplifting, for want of a better word, and indicas are more sedating. But that's so crude, it's hardly worth saying, I think. Oh, what does THC do? It's actually we only known it since 1964 when Raphael Meshulam in Israel uh, discovered it. I can't go through this in detail because of the length of time I need to keep an eye on. Um, I've said it's analgesic in its own right. This is uh, in its isolation. It's analgesic, anti-itch. Bronchodilatory is actually quite useful for respiratory problems rather than the opposite from smoking. It's antioxidant, it's neuroprotective, it's muscle relaxants, it's anti-sickness, and it's 20 times the power of aspirin in terms of anti-inflammatory. And you put all those together very quickly, you can see it's in its own right quite a useful medicine. And let's look at its, its, its cousin, CBD, cannabidiol, also neuroprotective. And that has particular properties of being anti-anxiety, anti-convulsant. And that's all the media around the children with drug and epilepsy. Uh, CBD is a very potent anti-convulsant. I'll come to in a moment. It's cytotoxic in some forms of breast cancer. It's anti-sickness. It stimulates bone fracture healing. It reduces the severity of stroke. And it's not particularly, I think I, think it's, I think I might change that slide. It is slightly sedative, uh, but not particularly, and it's not intoxicating. So again, just very briefly, I can't go through the detail and time we've got, but it just shows you that CBD in its own right has medical properties. But there are other things. You may what on earth is this lot? Uh, but very briefly, um, in the plant, these cannabinoids are in the acidic form, A for acid as far as I go in terms of my understanding of advanced chemistry, A for acid. Um, and it comes at CBG, cannabigerol, is broken down into that THC and CBD in their acidic forms. They are not psychoactive. Uh, so you can eat a cannabis plant, should you wish to, without heating it or doing anything with it, and you don't get high because you're eating the THC in acidic form, which is not psychoactive. So those films you see are someone stuffing stuffing flowering heads when the police knock at the door and eating them quickly and then getting high as a result is nonsense because you don't get high as a result of eating 
um, raw cannabis should end up we think of doing so. I'm not sure. No. Uh, it also produces CBC, cannabis chromine, and you, you get rid of the acid by heat or light or time, the so-called decarboxylation. And then you get THC and CBD and CBC, which have slightly different properties than the acidic forms. Just a quick example, there's 144, I think, the latest count of uh, cannabinoids. All of those that have been looked at have medical properties in their own right. So I can't go to 144, you'd be bored to tears. Just a couple at random level. CBG, we looked at there, that has properties, I won't go through it all. Glaucoma, it's antibacterial, it's apilite stimulant. These on the right are the uh, strains you can get that are, relatively speaking, fairly high in CBG, for example. So I won't go through that, just to give you the flavor that the, all the other cannabinoids have a role to play in medicine. Cannabichromine, anti-cancer, has a very good effect on acne and antidepressant, in fact, CBC. Then there's another one called varine. Any chemist in the audience can tell me what the hell varine is. I have no idea, but it's some other, some sort of chemical thing that attaches to it. And you put a V in it, so it's V acid, CBG, VA. It produces THC, VA. That's another whole family of cannabinoids. And they have also properties in their own right. Let's have a quick look at THCV, tetrahydrocannabidivarine. And that's the top one there. And it's very potent appetite suppressant. Very potent, and it may well be a very useful medicine for obesity, as an example. It also has, possibly has an effect on Alzheimer's disease. But for practical purposes, for, if you like, medical purposes, the balance between THC and CBD is what's important. Um, and what you need for particular conditions, you need to pick a strain that is high in THC, particularly, for example, for pain, or high in CBD, particularly, for example, for epilepsy. Just a quick thing on the terpenes. They're the things that give its characteristic smell. Uh, the, the, the cannabis you smell in the street uh, is the terpenes you're smelling, not the cannabinoids. And it comes in all sorts of things, but these also have medical properties. Limoline, not surprising, it's found in lemons, and you can read to yourself what it might, may or may not do. Mercine, likewise, quite sedating. That's quite useful to have in, in a component if you want some sedation. Um, beta caryophylline. That's the one I always give that story. I hope it's true. That's the thing that sniffer dogs detect at airports. So if you want to get through airports without being detected by a sniffer dog, get a strain that's very low in beta caryophylline, and then you can get through. I mean, the border guards might pick you up, but the dogs won't. Um, I hope that's right. <laughs> Let me know. Try it out. Alpha pinene, there you go. I won't go through all these. It's too far. Linalool. Very helpful as a local anesthetic and anticonvulsant. Again, that's particularly useful as anticonvulsant. So if the children are becoming resistant to cannabinoids as epilepsy, having a strain high in linalu might actually be quite helpful to have additional anticonvulsant effect. So again, just to give you an example, this is highly complicated. The basics are simple, but picking a strain, if you multiply all the, the terpenes, which are about 100, by the, all the uh, cannabinoids, which are about 144, and these things called flavonoids, which give it its coloring, they also have medical properties. You might have put all that together. There are literally trillions, trillions of combinations uh, for strains, all of which have subtle differences. And that's just one example. I think that was from the Leafly website. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, there's something like 2,500 strains listed on the Leafly website, um, all of them subtly different, which is why the, uh, there is a solution to uh, cannabis medicine, sort of pharmaceutical type cannabis medicine, but we're only going to get, let's say, six or eight or ten producers producing, say, six or eight or ten strains uh, to pick. But there are people out there who need much more subtlety than that, which will never come through um, medical cannabis. It, what we produce as a medicine will probably suit 90% of people. But the subtlety you need for some people need will come, frankly, from growing your own, because then you can grow your own um, plant in the exact strain you want. Is that all right, Kelly? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pay me later. Uh, so that uh, obviously that doesn't suit most people uh, because they want a, a medicine and they can't. They don't want to grow it. They don't want to do anything else with it. But um, that is does suit many people is to get that subtlety you can get from actually getting your own variety that suits your particular condition. It's a very personalised medicine. How do you take it? Very quickly. How am I doing for time? I've lost track of myself. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. How do you take it? Well, interesting, we've got, uh, uh, I think Leon's going to go through the law, aren't you, uh, later, but uh, how we can take it in this country is a very liberal regime, actually. 
We might complain about it because no doctors are prescribing it, but actually it's a very liberal regime. A doctor can write a prescription for any condition, any condition, not just pain or epilepsy, any condition that the doctor feels is worth uh, the evidence and the balance that might help in the best interest of that patient, any condition. And in any format except smoking. You can't prescribe a joint, but you can, you can prescribe in any other format. So you, can, you can't smoke it. I always put that up because I just love the picture. You can't do that, though. You can't smoke it. But you can vape it. And even vaping adds to the subtlety because the temperature you vape at determines what uh, uh, of those terpenes and cannabinoids come off at different vaping temperatures. So you get a different subtlety according to the vaping temperature. So that has another whole line of subtlety to the, pres to the prescription. And there's lots of, there's the original vape guy. I like that as well. He's not vaping at all, but anyway. Um, you can put it in uh, edibles. You can spray it. Sativex, for example, GW Farmer is a spray. You can make it into edibles. You can prescribe edibles. Or you can make the oil, if you like, into your own edibles. Uh, and these things are now in Canada and the uh, States, of course, are now uh, edible prescriptions are, are, are going up quite rapidly. You can, it's, it's quite um, lipophilic. Um, it doesn't like water either, so, but you can, there are ways of now dissolving it into water by nanotechnology. I'll pass over that in case anyone's an expert in nanotechnology because I have no idea what I'm talking about. But you can make it water, effectively water soluble. You can put it in a, in a cream for joints, you can make it into a repository. Uh, or a pessary, you can put a patch, you can, but most, most medicalized cannabis use will be in capsules or oil form, because doctors like prescribing numbers of capsules a day or milligrams per mil and such like. And that's, that's a sensible, uh, controlled way of doing it. So very briefly, some doctors won't prescribe, we'll go through why they won't prescribe later, but some will say there's not enough evidence, I'm not doing this because there's not enough evidence behind it. I'm um, first to admit that we need a lot more evidence. Yes, we do need a lot more evidence. We need to know a lot more about it, about what type, what strain is best for this or that, what dose, what format of giving it. There's a load of stuff. We'll be here forever more, finding more and more about the cannabis plant and all its subtleties. But there is enough evidence now from all these, uh, um, I think these can be available. Can these be available, John? Where well, he's gone, he's crept off somewhere. They can be available. Yeah, so if you want some of these references, but there's, there's plenty of other references. What is the evidence? I did this top one here, and what we looked at was very, very briefly. Uh, we did a class one study, a standard randomized controlled trial. Uh, class two was a little bit less, and three and four was just uh, expert opinion. So we ranked all the studies, about 2,000 we looked at. This is for the old party parliamentary group on drug policy reform, about 2016. Um, and we called the good evidence if there was at least two class one studies. The first thing to say is I don't think, I know, that cannabis does not lend itself very readily uh, to double-blind placebo-controlled studies. It won't work. Uh, so the standard doctor response that, we're not, that we can't accept this evidence except double-blind placebo-controlled studies is largely nonsense because it doesn't lend itself to that uh, for reasons I can go through questions and answers if you like. But we did look at that because we were being very um, uh, establishment when we did this and we said good evidence was at least two class one studies uh, section you can read the rest for yourself. So I'll just go through what, what we found was good evidence. And this is not just me, it was the, the other um, publications that I saw on the previous slide, from the, uh, particularly from the American uh, group. Good evidence for chronic pain. So why the Royal College of Physicians? Anyone here from the Royal College of Physicians? Good. I'm the Royal College of Physicians. I'm waiting for a letter through the post saying, you're no longer in the Royal College of Physicians. <laughs> Well, they haven't got there yet. Um, chronic, the, the Royal College of said there's not enough evidence to prescribe for pain. Ut utter and complete nonsense. Have they read the evidence? There's eight class one studies. There's, okay, there's not enough evidence, but there is evidence. If people are struggling with pain, they've tried all analgesics, uh, and why in God's name don't they, why don't they allow prescription of cannabis? What is wrong with the Royal College of Physicians is beyond me. And that, you know, as though all the Canadians, Germans, Italians, Spaniards, Americans in half of America are wrong. Uh, but the Royal College of Physicians, good old British Royal College of Physicians, is of course right. I've finished now, another political outburst. Uh, there's enough evidence for chronic pain. Of, of that, there is no doubt at all. 
was good evidence of spasticity, not surprisingly. Uh, Sativex GW Pharma was licensed for spasticity. As there's probably more evidence for spasticity management uh, in the context of multiple sclerosis, but spasticity is spasticity, so it doesn't matter what it's due to. It's, it could be uh, spinal injury or brain injury or stroke or whatever. Good evidence for management of spasticity. Nausea and vomiting, even the Royal College of Physicians said reluctantly you might be able to use it in nausea and vomiting. Uh, there's good evidence of that in the context of chemotherapy. Uh, there are 23 controlled trials confirming efficacy in nausea and sickness. Good evidence in anxiety for CBD, and good evidence uh, for, sorry, for CDB and anxiety, and I would now add epilepsy. Um, Epidiolex, there are studies. I don't, uh, uh, Epidiolex works. It's a pure CBD, as I said earlier. It, can it has a remarkable effect on reducing seizures in children with drug-resistant epilepsy. You get a better effect, I believe, uh, uh, with full extract product. Um, the famous, uh, well-known case of Alfie Dingley uh, is he had 5,000 seizures a month. 500 or 5,000, I forget. A lot, anyway. 500 seizures a month. Uh, that reduced to nothing at all with full extract cannabis. Nothing at all. And that's, but of course, then a doctor told me that was a placebo effect. Really? Um, it does work for children with epilepsy. And that's that, it was that media campaign that changed the law, which we'll come to later. So it's good evidence for epilepsy. There's moderate evidence. It works, but we need more information. Sure, we do. For appetite stimulation, fibromyalgia, works with pain of that, sleep disorders, PTSD. There's moderate evidence for that. I think if people are struggling with these conditions, then I would think personally that we should prescribe for this and learn as we go along. Let's learn as we go along. Let's try this, try that, and uh, learn what is best for these conditions. Some evidence, because it, it gets less and less in terms of evidence for glaucoma, you can read it for yourself, Tourette's, bladder dysfunction, uh, aspects of Parkinson's disease and agi for agitation in dementia. And we didn't make a recommendation for these. It doesn't mean it doesn't work for these, but it just means there wasn't the studies done. And the big one there is cancer. There was endless uh, anecdotal stories and case studies on cancer uh, in, on the internet. And there's definitely animal models that some of the cannabinoids have anti-cancer effect of that, there's no doubt. Uh, it is, but we shouldn't forget, of course, that the cannabis is a wellness product. So even if you don't believe it helps the actual cancer, it'd be very useful for cancer, for example, for pain, uh, for sickness, for epilepsy, for spasticity, for lessening anxiety. So it can be a very good wellness product for cancer, even if you don't believe it's helping the cancer. And it probably isn't helping the cancer for many, many types of cancer, but it probably is for some other types of cancer. There's a lot we don't know about its anti-cancer effects. It's also very useful for Crohn's disease. As a study recently showed about half the population of Crohn's disease were using cannabis. I don't think half the population of Crohn's disease people would be using cannabis if it didn't do something for them. Uh, so we need to take more notice, I think, of real, what is now a lovely term, real world data. Actually believe the people who are taking it and don't say it's all rubbish until we've done double blind placebo controlled studies. So 1st November, great day. We changed the law, and Leon's going to tell us how we changed the law to make prescription available. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a very good uh, legal change in the misuse of drugs regulations in this country now. But what happened? It didn't really work um, because so far up to date, not one single NHS prescription has been written. Not one. There's been 22 in the private sector, and the private clinics opening at it can argue for or against private clinics, but at least the private clinics are prescribing and we're learning from that process. 22 people, uh, probably a million people today will use cannabis illegally for medical conditions. But there's not one in the NHS, so the NHS is a little bit conservative. There are reasons for that we'll go into later. Um, I've come to the end of my time, I think. That was a very quick, sorry if it was too quick, a very quick overview of the basics of cannabis medicine. I'm now going to pass over to the person who actually knows what she's talking about because she's done it and has learnt from it. Um, and Danny, Danny Gordon, medical cannabis treatments and approach to prescribing, clinical experience, and difficult areas. So, Danny, you're going to, we're going to flow. We're going to have questions and answers uh, at the end, if that's all right, so we can flow from one to the other. All yours. Are you wired up? Or do you want this? I'm wired up. You're wired up. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, it's a bit of a whirlwind. I do apologize. I am going to skip some slides, but it's, it, I think these will be available to you. Mike's given us a great intro, so thank you so much. So what I'm going to talk about is my 
prescribing experience. I'm a medical doctor. I'm double board certified in integrative medicine in the US, which is now a bona fide specialty of medicine in the United States. In Canada, I'm a GP with a special interest. And basically what that means is I do herbal medicine and drugs and I combine them and I've been doing it for the past decade in my practice. I've only officially added cannabis in the last four, I guess four years. Um, the reason for that are largely political. I was using other herbs along with drugs in my practice for many years. And I also had patients doing really interesting things with cannabis for years. They were putting it through their juicer. I had patients in their 80s and 90s who had these big farms out in British Columbia. And uh, they were juicing it with spinach in the morning. And uh, you know, it just really fascinated me. So I won't get into how I got into cannabis. It's a long story. But it's a combination of my patients um, working with an herbalist in the community, using it with my cancer patients, making sure they didn't you know, overdose with opioids, and uh, trying to treat their pain. And also my own personal experience having chronic pain myself after an accident. Um, so basically the whole point of this slide is cannabis is a really cool molecule because, or I mean plant, because it has so many molecules inside of it. And it's both a botanical medicine and it's also a drug. And it's really cool because botanical medicines, they do lots of different things in the body because there's hundreds of different chemicals and thousands of different chemicals that are biologically active, as Mike has shared with us already. And that's just different than how drugs work, which also makes cannabis really hard to study in this RCT model, this randomized control trial model. But it also makes it work for lots of interesting things. And just a recap of the endocannabinoid system, cannabis also works because it works on our own endogenous cannabis system in our own brains and our own bodies. And this is a really crazy busy slide, but these are all of the chemical, well not all, these are many of the chemicals in the cannabis plant that are non-intoxicating. They're all psychoactive, non-intoxicating. So this is just an example of how rich this plant really is as a potential medication and as a wellness supplement. I won't get into this too much, Mike's already covered it, but basically sativa versus indica doesn't really exist anymore. Everyone's kind of married their cousins in the cannabis genetics world. And basically you can think of things as broadleaf now versus narrow leaf, but even that gets tricky because terpenes actually uh, account for a lot of the, the kind of feel of, um, or nature of a certain strain. Um, people always ask me, how does hemp CBD differ? It's a whole nother topic, but basically you can get some strains where the CBG, the enzymes that the plant produces are different and it converts it more into CBD and it shunts it towards the CBD pathway versus the THC pathway. That's really an oversimplification, but you know, basically that's how it works. So I'm going to share with you my approach to dosing and prescribing. Um, you know, I'm going to get down to the one pager. I'm going to go through some of these quickly. And you know, basically what it comes down to is cannabis can be used in so many different ways. There's really no other drug that we can do this with. We can give it to someone as a topical. I slather it all over my patients in nursing homes who have a million aches and pains. And so they can just get around a little bit easier. And it's really safe. Um, you can also have people vaporize it. You can, we can give it to people in capsules. When I first started practicing cannabis medicine, we had oils. We didn't have capsules yet. And we, we, what we used to do in the clinic is I used to have my assistant um, use a dropper and make homemade capsules for some of my patients who couldn't really measure the, the oil properly. Um, it was very kind of DIY. And so we've come a long way already. Um, so basically the main things we use for patients in a medical context is vaporizing, oral versus an oil or a capsule, and topical. Uh, Mike's already gone through this, but basically the raw plant has all the acid forms, the A's at the ends, and then when you heat the plant or you expose it to UV light, then you get the active CBD and THC. So this is a really, I, I really like this way of thinking about it, you know, like a quick and dirty approach to thinking about the differences in the way that cannabis affects people. And again, this is not factoring in all of the other plant chemicals, which do play a role when you get fancier. Um, I approach cannabis by a layered approach. So when I teach doctors who are only trained in Western medicine, I keep it really simple at first because if I start telling them about the different herbal signatures of different strains, their brain kind of explodes and then they also think it's all a bit woo-woo. Um, so this is a nice way to start. This is only talking about CBD versus THC. So if you have 0%, uh, zero parts CBD and all parts THC, relatively speaking, 
you're going to have a lot of psychotropic effects, potentially very intoxicating effects. Um, and then on the other side, you have basically what hemp CBD is. So all CBD, virtually no THC. And in the middle is where most medical cannabis kind of sits. Because THC is not bad. It just has potential for intoxication, but not all of the time. And I'll get into that. So what do I do with patients who come to me uh, and they've never had cannabis before? At least 60% of my patients, a lot of them are seniors, and they've never tried cannabis in their life. Some of the people I treat are retired police officers, and they're law enforcement people. Um, and some of them are just you know, people who are told that drugs are bad, and they're really scared of it, and they don't want to get high. So we start really gently with them. And basically, the name of the game is you use a high CBD oil during the daytime first. And then if they need sleep support and nighttime pain support, you add a tiny bit, what a lot of people will call a microdose of a THC, usually in what we think of as an indica variety. Although, as we've said, that's kind of a little bit arbitrary these days. And you just go, you know, go really slowly with their dosing. Um, this is just a really typical, really slow titration. Some of my patients only need five milligrams total of, of THC before they go to bed to help with their sleep and their night pain, but other people might need 20 milligrams because everyone's endocannabinoid system is different. And the really interesting thing about practicing cannabis medicine is you just learn so much from just practicing. It's, it's a lot like herbal medicine. Well, it is herbal medicine, but it's done in a more kind of rigorous, more medical context. So for example, I have patients who don't get high from a balanced vaporized strain of cannabis that has lots of THC because they've been on so much opioid medication for their really severe chronic pain for many years. And it's almost like they're not as sensitive to the intoxicating effects of THC as say I would be because I'm on no pain medications. Um, that's not a published finding, but it's something that I've developed over the years. This is like the wisdom of, of practice that you know all us, all, all us doctors have to acquire over the years. Um, so I just kind of repeat, this is just kind of what I just said, but basically, you know, dosing will differ patient to patient. Um, and what do I do with people who are already self-medicating when they come to see me? Well, a lot of times they're already using high THC, low CBD cannabis because that's all they can get reliably. Um, and in that case, a lot of times I'm actually having them move towards higher CBD strains or adding in CBD on top of the THC they're using to balance the effects. And even with people who are, you know, over, some of my patients potentially are over medicating with THC, they have anxiety and they're using uh, high THC strains for their anxiety. But what's happening is they're getting this rebound effect. So it temporarily lowers their anxiety level, but because of the bell-shaped curve effect that THC has on anxiety, they're actually getting this rebound anxiety. So when I get them to lower their THC dose, they actually get better. And this is just the really interesting, cool part about cannabis. It's really individualized, as Mike has said. Um, vaporizing cannabis, there's been one researcher in the Netherlands who thinks that the optimal extraction temperature is maybe 201 degrees Celsius. I mean, this is pretty arbitrary still, but basically you have different temperatures of vaporizing will um, give off different terpenes at different temperatures, different cannabinoids at different temperatures. So it's like it's like a it's like an educated guessing game in the beginning. Some of my patients vaporize closer to the 217 degree mark because they want more CBN. CBN is actually a breakdown product from THC, but it can also be really good for some forms of chronic pain. But it can also be quite sedating. So you know it's just this investigative process that you go through with your patient together. Um, vaporizer types, there's lots of different types. I'm not really going to go into it, but when I talk about vaporizing cannabis, I don't mean these, the vape oils, the vape pens. I mean putting a, a flower into a dry herbal vaporizer and, and using that from a medical perspective. There's a really cool app called Druid, if you don't know about it. Um, even if people are self-medicating with cannabis, I always tell them about this. It basically is, it's been used in a few, few research trials in North America. And it's a way of self-measuring levels of impairment, potentially for driving after you use any substance. But cannabis, it works quite well. It's not you know, a legal, you, know, you can't use this as a legal defense in court or anything if you get pulled over and they think you're intoxicated. But it, it's a really good tool. So strain selection, it really does matter for some patients. You know, I have a lot of colleagues in Canada who are not trained in herbal medicine. And they just approach cannabis 
from just the major cannabinoids. So they just want to know how much CBD is in something and how much THC is in something. And they get good results with at least 50% of their patients doing just that. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you can get a bit fancier and you can start choosing strains and then you get really interesting results. I get a lot of referrals that say, you know, things like non-responders. Oftentimes it's just trying another strain and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater just because the first product you've tried didn't work. There's also even inter-batch variation. So even if you start with the same seed and you grow it in similar conditions, sometimes there would be a slight difference in one of the enzymes produced um, by the time this final product has been made and shipped off to you know, one of the, the licensed producer uh, um, product uh, plants. And it can affect how patients respond because it's an herbal medicine. <clears throat> I'm gonna go over these. Proper storage is really important in a cool place, in a dark amber container, ideally um, with lower moisture than you would use in a humidor for, um, for cigars, so 58% moisture. There's packs you can buy, you can ask me after. Um, okay, this is the summary. If you don't know how to get started, you start with just a really high CBD, low THC oil. I often get asked, can you use hemp CBD for this? Sure, you can try, but you oftentimes won't get the same response because that small amount of THC in these high CBD medical oils does tend to give a better response at lower doses. So oftentimes it's gonna save patients money. That being said, in the UK at the moment, we don't have access to great uh, numbers of products. So if someone's using a CBD oil from hemp, and then they add in a little bit of a THC medical, med medical oil, it actually you know, might, be, might be worthwhile to try that first. Um, okay, so when we talk about contraindications, a lot of these contraindications you see here are for THC, not for CBD. There's actually very few, if any, contraindications to CBD. Pregnancy and breastfeeding is a really tricky area. I don't have time to go into great detail, but basically we don't have enough information saying that CBD is safe. It probably seems pretty safe, but we just don't know for sure. And we have cannabis receptors in the re female reproductive tract. So, you know, I tell patients best to avoid all cannabis when they're pregnant and they're breastfeeding, but I have had patients go against my medical advice, stay on their CBD oil, because they had come off of a lot of other medications to get down to just CBD. And they've had a normal pregnancy, normal delivery, the first year, two years, you know, what we know so far has been normal. So probably pretty safe, but again, it's a contentious issue, so until we know more, the doctor line is avoid it. Um, these are relative contraindications. I still prescribe in these cases, and I often do use THC, but I'm really careful. And I have a really uh, lengthy discussion with my patients with the potential risks. So cardiovascular risk, basically this means if you have a history of a heart condition, and you've had a recent heart attack or a stroke, or you have a funny rhythm in your heart, it's possible that THC can play a role in slightly increasing the risk of having another cardiac event. It's possible. It's unlikely, but it's possible. And this is due to a number of different effects that THC has on the cardiac, on the heart, the cardiovascular system. So it increases the work of pumping action of the heart, THC. And it also, if someone accidentally overdoses on their THC, I, I once had a patient who uh, accidentally mixed up their bottles, so their high CBD and their high THC, and um, luckily she didn't have a heart condition, but she was, she was elderly and she ended up having to go to the emergency room because she was having a panic attack because she thought she was taking her CBD and she was actually taking her THC. So it's possible. So if you have a panic attack and it's really scary and you've never tried cannabis before and you've accidentally overdosed yourself on THC, it could potentially put more strain on your heart as well through this indirect kind of uh, anxiety pathway. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, I need to go back. Okay. So people always want to know, well, what do I do with my cardiac patients? I usually start with a high CBD, low THC product. So that's like a 20 to 1 or a 25 to 1 parts CBD. So super, super high CBD trace THC. But then the problem is, is a lot of my cardiac patients, they have horrible chronic pain. They're on high doses of opioids. Those have lots of side effects too. So I do sometimes use THC with them, but I use it usually in a long acting oil and I use it with a high amount of CBD. And I started really real microdoses, like one milligram of THC. 
Um, and I try to avoid vaping in these patients, especially if they're not used to cannabis because it just goes to the brain a lot quicker. So far, I've not had any cardiac events in my cardiac risk patients using cannabis this way. So I think it's quite safe. Um, but if someone's really high risk, I'm working with their, their heart doctor, with their cardiologist as well on this, making sure that they have regular follow-ups, regular checks on the heart, all that kind of stuff. So people always ask me about cannabis and cancer. What do I do? This pretty much sums up cannabis and cancers at the moment. Um, yeah, it's really complicated. So most interactions with, with cannabis and most chemotherapy agents are unknown. It's like this giant question mark. And I often get patients coming to me because they've been diagnosed with cancer. It's really scary. And then you're told on top of having cancer that you have to have this poison put into your body um, that's going to make you feel like you might want to die. And that's really the only option you have. So people, often, you know, they're looking for another way. Um, but at this time, we don't have good enough evidence to suggest that cannabis is a replacement for chemotherapy. So, you know, I, I get calls all the time. People ask me, can I just, you know, for, forego all conventional treatment and try cannabis? Um, I just don't recommend it at this time. And I've seen some poor outcomes doing just that by the time they get to me. Um, and then we're trying to, you know, treat them. And they might have had a, a curable cancer, but that cancer, but then it's progressed. So different cancers potentially have different effects with the endocannabinoid system. Because we now know, now that we, as doctors actually know that we have this thing called the endocannabinoid system before, we just didn't really even know it existed. So now that we know that, we also know that tumor types have different receptors. So let's say you have a breast cancer. Well, there's lots of different kinds of breast cancer. If you have a tumor that's that does not express endocannabinoid receptors, it's going to potentially have a different response to cannabis therapy than a tumor that has a cannabinoid receptor positive. Just like estrogen receptor positive tumors versus estrogen receptor negative tumors. Um, so, you know, what do I use it for in my cancer patients? Well, it's very, very helpful with having them get through their chemotherapy easier and better. And I've also used higher doses of CB, high CBD in my patients who are at really high risk due to the types of chemotherapy that they're on for getting the neuropathy, like the burning hands and feet, that horrible side effect that a lot of people get. Um, and I just, I'm really honest with them. I said, you know, we don't know how it's gonna affect your chemo. That's really the honest answer. And if they're not okay with that, then we wait till after their chemo's done and then we start. Uh, but it, a lot of times people just say, you know, I just want to give it a go and I just want to make sure I can get through my chemo and, you know, not feel hor hor horrible. Um, and a lot of times with my cancer patients, I have them vaporize because it potentially is easier to get rid of and process through the body and you don't get all the metabolites sticking around quite as long as when you take oral oils. But a lot of times it's a combination and everyone is different. But I've had some patients who I don't think could have gotten through their second, third rounds of chemo without this. There's tons of potential drug interactions uh, that, are, that are possible because cannabis, like everything else, goes through this system called the cytochrome P450 system. It's this basically all these enzymes in our liver that break stuff down. It breaks down alcohol, it breaks down drugs, it breaks down pesticides in your food, all that kind of stuff. So these are the only things that have documented evidence. I go through these with patients. A lot of them don't really even apply. Um, with warfarin, patients who are on that blood thinner that you have to keep testing their blood all the time, I do use cannabis, but just, I'm just really careful. And we just make sure that their, you know, their, their level of warfarin and their, their thinning of the blood, this thing called the INR, it's just, you know, it's stable. Um, so it's possible. Okay, these are the things where you can use cannabis clinically for. So in Canada, I have a referral only practice, but I practice across all of the specialties. So I've actually, I've actually used cannabis for all of these things, except for I haven't had any psychotic patients because the medical legal risk, basically, to be perfectly honest with you. But CBD alone um, in a patient with a chronic psychosis is probably very safe and may have um, helpful properties combined with their other drugs. Um, but it's a risky area medical legally, in, even in Canada. So I, I do avoid it. Um, you know, the interesting thing is when I see patients for a lot of these conditions, Oftentimes, especially when you're using high CBD strains, low THC, the results keep getting better and better month after month because CBD works all over the place in your endocannabinoid system. So it's, it's kind of, it kind of doesn't want to you know, pigeonhole itself in the CB1 receptor or the CB2 receptor. It just kind of wants to float around and do its own little thing, sprinkle its magic around. 
So when I see patients who, you know, are, have a chronic condition like fibromyalgia, I do a lot of fibromyalgia chronic fatigue, a lot of times they take months to really see the full effect of the therapy and they have to keep using it. So this is something I really stress when I work with patients. Um, the THC, the high THC products that I use, sometimes for sleep, sometimes for night pain, they work in you know, minutes to days. Um, there's a cluster of conditions that really show up in my office a lot because I'm an integrated medicine doctor, so I tend to attract patients who have seen everybody and have tried everything. Um, and no one knows what to do with these, these poor folks anymore. And they usually come on about 20 different medications that they've piled on top of each other over the years. Nothing's really working that well. And this cluster of things falls under something called the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. Yes, it is still a theory. I always get asked this by, I, I got corrected on, a, you know, by a colleague by not really specifying this is a theory. Um, but we do have some preliminary studies that show, yeah, the endocannabinoid system is probably functioning differently in different people. Like in fibromyalgia, it's this horrible condition where you just feel pain all over you. You wake up feeling like a truck has run over you and that's just how you just live your life. Um, it's really horrible. And the endocannabinoid system may play a huge role. It may be that the base level of tone for pain is just gone a bit wonky. And in the endocannabinoid system, which controls pain, which controls pain perception on so many different levels, we think that this basal tone of our system may play a huge role. And I, I think this is why, with my fibromyalgia patients and similar disorders, why cannabis works about a thousand times better than any other drug or a combination of drugs that we've had them on in the past. Um, so now I just want to share some, some cases with you guys. So this was a lovely gentleman who came to see me, and he had a metal scaffolding fall on his head at work. He'd been off work for seven years when I saw him, and he had these things called petite mal seizures. Um, after his traumatic brain injury, and he had just this crushing fatigue. A lot of these post-concussive patients have this to varying degrees. He was the extreme case. Um, and actually, his GP was, was very understanding. He said, oh, why don't you just take some CBD? Um, but he, he wanted to come see someone who kind of knew a bit more, so his GP kindly referred him. And, you know, luckily we saw him because he was on Clobazam. So that's one of the medications that can potentially interact with CBD but usually only at really high levels. So unless you get over levels of giving 100 milligrams a day of CBD and they're on high levels of Clobazam, it's very unlikely that they would raise the drug levels, but it's possible. So in you know, the theory of doing good medicine, you know, we tested his Clobazam levels at baseline and then we kept testing them every few months and he was fine. Um, there was no change in his levels. And so what happened to him? So we started him on a high CBD oil for during the day. He had a lot of sleep disruption from a variety of different sources. His nervous system was just really out of whack after his accident. And then he was, he was uh, vaping for this breakthrough pain because a lot of my patients have chronic pain in the background, which is like a five out of 10 all the time. And then they have these breakthrough pain episodes where they just completely incapacitated, sometimes for entire days. Um, so like a lot of my patients, you know, the goal here was to get him off a lot of his morphine because it was having, you find, I find this a lot in patients on chronic morphine, chronic opioids, their mood starts to really go as well. So he was getting, he was depressed. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people get depressed with chronic pain. Um, you know, not just the opioids, but we we're able to get him at four months, 50% reduction in his opioids. And then at almost at a year, he was about 75% reduced. Um, and that was just huge for him. That, that alone was, was life changing. Um, I also got him to do a mindfulness-based stress reduction practice. So because I'm an integrative doctor, I don't like to do some people with cannabis. Um, I try to get them meditating and doing other things. But oftentimes, the patients who come to see me are so sick that they can't engage in cognitive behavioral therapy. They can't meditate because their nervous systems are so hyper-aroused and they're in so much pain. So it's like a chicken or egg. So interestingly, I often use cannabis as a catalyst to make them feel a little bit better. <laughs> And then it's like this positive snowball effect. They can start doing other things too that really help them. And that made me really happy. He would, when he came to see me, he was really interested in meditation, but he just wasn't able to do it at the time. Um, this is another gentleman who came to see me. I do a lot of mood disorder work. So this is one of the categories of evidence that is still you know, insufficient as far as the RCTs. So when I first started prescribing cannabis, I didn't want to use it in depression. I was scared. I was scared someone was going to sue me. I was scared someone might go go psychotic on me. Um, but 
what I found is that a lot of my patients with depression were saying, they were coming to me, they're already self-medicating, they were saying this is the only thing that's really helped them. So I started very cautiously and working usually with their psychiatrist, because um, I, you know, I work in the referral model, using a little bit of cannabis with my patients with depression. And um, this is a perfect example. This gentleman here, he said he had never had a normal sleep in his entire life, and he was 60 years old. He'd had sleep studies, he had tried you know, every drug. He'd even tried St. John's Ward, he'd tried to go natural. Um, he'd seen, he'd done every therapy that you can think of. I mean, he was really, really trying um, to, to, to heal himself, to find a way. And, you know, what we did for him is I used CBD. I mean, you can see a trend here, CBD oil during the day. Um, and I did use quite, you know, quite a fair bit of THC for him at nighttime um, along with CBD. And he came back to me a week after we started the THC at night, and he said he slept normally for the first time. He felt like a normal person when he woke up. He never knew what that felt like before. He was 60 years old. So what happened to him? Well, he started getting hobbies. He, he started getting you know, a life again. Um, and yes, this is not a cure. You know, it's not a cure for his depression, but it was an amazing tool that completely changed his life. Why wouldn't we use this in, in patients? I mean, you know, it just, it's incredible to me that people are, some of my colleagues are so, so close-minded. Um, this is a lady who came to me for chronic migraines. She was a really busy mom. She, she was actually at home with her kids when she came to see me, but she had had to quit her job, which she absolutely loved, but it was a high-stress job. She worked in the corporate world. And she had to quit because the migraines were, were really um, disrupting her ability to work. And even now that she was at home, she had this massive guilt because she'd be in bed some days with her migraines. And she had, she, she, you know, when we, we first met, she basically broke down in my office and said, I feel like a terrible mom. You know, I've missed all these things for my kids because I'm in bed some days with these migraines. She was in bed sometimes two days a week with her migraines. And she had tried everything. She was sent to me by her neurologist. And she had a really good response to cannabis. So interestingly, with migraines, you can get this biphasic response, meaning sometimes if you put them on too much CBD too fast, they get worse migraines. But it, there's a way around that. I don't have time to go into it. But basically with her, we, we, um, tight, we, we slowly increased her CBD over a period of months. And then for her immediate onset migraines to help stop the migraine, we used vaporized cannabis with strains high in some terpenes that are anti-inflammatory and anti-spasmodic. And it worked really well for her. Um, she, she literally you know, said it changed her entire family dynamic, just having this tool available for her. And um, this is a really common story. This guy's a busy dad. Um, he was really worried about his kids thinking he was a stoner. He had never tried cannabis. Um, but he had, he, he had terrible chronic pain. Um, and he was really depressed as well. And I, you know, it's always the chicken or egg. Was he depressed before the chronic pain? This guy actually wasn't. He, he started getting depressed after the chronic pain, and then he had to go on disability. And it, it just affects people's whole life and their sense of self when they feel like they cannot contribute to society the way that they want to. And one of the things I had to overcome myself, one of my prejudices against cannabis before I prescribed it, and I was an herbal medicine person, but one of my prejudices was I was going to make my patients lazier. They weren't going to want to do stuff. And the opposite happened. People actually go back to work when you put them on cannabis, which is, you know, a lot of people think that's crazy. But this is what happens. Um, we got him off of his opioids completely. And this is very common with a lot of my patients because as, you know, anyone who knows who's a practitioner in this room, for chronic pain, for chronic non-cancer pain, opioids just don't work that well. And they work less well the longer you take them, but they get more side effects. So, you know, when we get people off of these things, that alone is life-changing, but you can't just pull them off of it because then they have worse pain. So you have to give them something instead. And this is the last case I want to share with you. So this is a girl with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she was a student. She'd had to stop her degree twice. Um, she was on the maximal medical therapy. She was getting IV infusions of, uh, of immune drugs. She had to keep going back on steroids. It was making her face blow up. You know, it was just, it was horrible. Um, so we added cannabis very, actually very gingerly at first because she was on so many medications. Um, and she was able to come off steroids for the first time in years. And she had, 
um, the first steroid-free interval of nine months that she'd had in years um, after she added the cannabis. She actually went back to finish her degree the next semester. It was really life-changing for her. Um, and I use something called THCA. You can ask me about it after with some of my patients with the rheumatological and the autoimmune conditions. THCA potentially has some anti-autoimmune effects. It's not well published. This is kind of an off-label use even for cannabis, but I have had success uh, in some cases. Um, so this is just to end off, you know, I could tell you dozens of stories like I've just shared with you. This drum set represents one of my patients who um, showed up on a video. I do a lot of video telemedicine because I do things across Canada to remote communities. And he booked kind of an impromptu visit with me and I wasn't sure why because I, I thought maybe he wasn't doing well. And he, he had surprised me with a concert. So he had rebuilt his home music studio. He was a drummer. He was a professional drummer. And he hadn't drummed in about seven years. And he had got his first gig in seven years after we put him on cannabis. He was on month nine. His arthritis was more manageable. And he had redone his music room. He, he played me a little concert for five minutes. And it was just so horrible. Like, I still get choked up when I talk about it because that's never happened to me when I put someone on an antidepressant or give them morphine. Like, no one's ever played me a concert after that. <laughs> um, I've had patients make me really... I mean, it's just, it's so interesting, the human connection that comes along with doing this, this kind of medicine. I've had patients make me an apron. It's one of the patients, uh, she sewed me an apron for my clinic that had pockets. I'm not sure what I was supposed to use it for, but it was really sweet. Um, this is the gentleman I treated who was a rancher, and he lived in Alberta in rural Canada. He couldn't get on his horse anymore because he had such bad spinal pain. And we got him on cannabis and didn't cure his spinal pain. He was, you know, he has like proper spinal disease that you can't cure. Um, but he, he actually got his son to video message me from his horse, and he was riding around in his horse on his ranch. Um, so this is, you know, this is what we see happen to people. And you know, these are the positive side effects. And when people always ask me, what is cannabis a gateway to, to drug use and to addiction, I found quite the opposite. I found it's a gateway to improve quality of life, to you know, just basically all the positive things that we want for our patients with chronic very hard to treat conditions, it seems to help with a lot of these things in a way that any other single drug often fails. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're gonna make a, make a start now. Is everyone suitably refreshed, I hope? Good, okay. Um, so <coughs> let me just um, introduce myself. My name's uh, Dr. Leon Barron. I'm a, I'm a GP. I probably describe myself as a what you might call a portfolio GP, in that I do a variety of work. Um, at the moment, I'm, I do a lot of NHS work. I, I also do lots of out-of-hours work. I, I'm a visiting tutor at UCL, so I teach undergraduate medicine, um, primarily this dermatology, pediatrics. Um, I've also um, more recently been um, doing some work with Mike and Danny uh, towards the academy and the, the clinic, the cannabis clinics. Um, but essentially, I'm a, I'm a busy, busy GP. Um, my interest in cannabis has really come about from questioning some of the sort of um, uh, the ways perhaps that I'm managing my patients day to day. Uh, just a, a typical few days in, in a busy GP practice, you'll see the way that we struggle at times to, to manage certain symptoms and conditions. You know, I get piles of repeat scripts for various drugs and you just often sign them off and uh, you know with time limited and it just feels sometimes that we um, that perhaps there's other ways of, of, of looking at how we're, we're treating patients. Um, I've also kept a close eye on the um, the progression overseas in Canada and um, Holland and Germany where this is becoming more mainstream. Uh, you can't um, deny that you know there's patients out there that are, are reporting very positive effects with cannabis and often life-changing life um, uh, effects for some, some, some families and, and epileptic children and so on. So, yeah, my, I've had a, um, you know, a, a strong interest for some time now. That led me to try and look for conferences or seminars, and they're very few and far between. Um, I was lucky to meet Mike uh, last year. Um, and more recently, Danny, and, uh, and, and really that's, that's, that's where I am with it. So, you know, I'm fairly new to the, this space as well, um, but um, it's very interesting. So, um, okay, let's, let me give you a, just an overview of, of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm just 
briefly going to bring us up to date with the UK regulation. Um, I'm going to, again, briefly talk about published guidelines that, that Mike has, has, has already touched upon earlier, um, and then some trends of how we're prescribing in, in primary care, common symptoms and conditions, and my sort of thoughts on why I think this is actually quite well suited to, to GPs and primary care in general. So um, following uh, events last summer where um, there was a lot of media coverage um, which was related to epilep uh, some epileptic children who were struggling to, um, uh, to, to control symptoms, that I think the public perception changed and the government fortunately picked up um, on this. Uh, the Home Secretary um, um, uh, suggested that there was you know, more, um, that, uh, the, that certain um, studies should be done, and the Chief Medical Officer essentially um, produced a report, and ultimately um, cannabis was rescheduled to a Schedule II drug, uh, which, which, was, which was great news at the time. Um, now, Schedule II drug needs tight regulations around import and export, production and supply, and uh, the subsequent... Um, information from the government and the Department of Social Health and NHS England said that only specialists should be prescribing these types of products. Um, interestingly, in Jersey, uh, it was opened up to all medical practitioners, including GPs. So um, this is just a, a quote from the NHS England and the Department of Social Health. Um, it, in a po quite a positive way, they, they've not restricted the, the types of conditions that we could prescribed for, but there's um, just emphasizing the fact that it needs to be something that's sort of not being met by traditional licensed medicines or when other options have been exhausted. So for, shortly on, following from, from that, the uh, Royal College of Physicians published their, um, their guidelines, and although they, were, they highlighted uh, the side effects of chemotherapy, uh, that you could potentially use this as a last resort, they're they really not uh, particularly... Um, you know, uh, their, their views are rather conservative, should we say, and, um, you know, they're, they're not really endorsing it for chronic pain. Uh, this was also in line with the Royal College of Radiologists and the Faculty of Pain. The British Paediatric Neurology Association was also uh, very conservative um, for perhaps good reasons that, you know, we have to be very, very careful when prescribing for children. Uh, they, they do touch upon epi dialects, so pure CBD, for um, sort of rare forms of epilepsy, um, but really the message is at the moment there's, um, there, there's not enough clinical trials. The British Neurologists, Association of British Neurologists, they, um, they talk about MS and spasticity, and uh, Sativex, which is currently a licensed product. Um, it's very, very hard for patients to actually get hold of in the UK. Um, for NICE have said it's not cost effective, so um, it's, the reality is it's not really a... a a, a treatment for many patients with, with MS. And, and they also touch upon the, um, the rare forms of epilepsy and uh, CBD, which is, as we know, is, 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 is a very safe, safe uh, type of medication. The, uh, everyone's waiting for NICE guidelines, so they're, they're due to be published in October of this year. And um, I, I think they, you know, clearly they'll, they'll be useful, but um, many of the colleges are sort of sitting on the fence with things at the moment because we're just waiting for a bit more to come through. So um, GPs were issued with this document uh, in November, uh, trying to give us some assistance, if you like, for when patients come in and talk to us. Uh, it's, it, again, it, it gives a, a few very useful pointers, um, but essentially it tells us to you know, be realistic with patients and their expectations and what they, they, they you know, the outcome of um, this type of, treatment because that actually at the moment it's it's a very difficult convoluted pro process so um this is something that i've certainly been asked um you know from a number of patients C can i just ask are there many doctors in the audience can we have a show of hands at all okay that's you know has, and has anyone been asked the same sort of questions yeah <laughs> so we're all getting it you know if, um actually more and more frequently i find people are asking not only about CBD products and what our thoughts are on, on those, but um, medical cannabis as well. And it's a difficult question to answer because um, it's complicated. The reality is it's, uh, it's poorly understood by doctors and, and patients. Um, it's very complex 
um, uh, process to, to obtain a script. Um, you know, we, uh, we continue to see people that are self-medicating with recreational cannabis, uh, which we tend to turn a, a bit of a blind eye to now because if they say it, it helps, then it, it, it helps. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's difficult because uh, the reality is scripts aren't, aren't being issued. Um, as Mike suggest, uh, po spoke about earlier, they, there have been some in the private sector, but again, the number is very low. So why f so few prescriptions? I think education is, is a key point here, and also it's, it, it's difficult to obtain a script. There's, um, it's very difficult to ob obtain products, uh, especially high-quality products, and, um, and <coughs> as a result, the price is very high. So all these scripts have to be on a special, unlicensed basis, so it's a named product for a named patient with a special import license through the MHRA, and it's, it's complex, it's expensive. And also, we don't have the backing from uh, uh, the, the institutions, if you like, and the, and the NICE guidelines yet. So um, I, th I think GPs are, are well-placed to be in this space um, for a number of reasons. So we, um, we're obviously the first point of contact for our patients, and we do tend to have a, a very broad overview of, of all um, the symptoms and problems. You know, we see all the different specialists that have um, been involved with, with care. Uh, we, you know, we see patients in their home environment often. We meet family members. And uh, I think we just have that sort of broad overview, really, of, of care. Um, there's other things to think about as well. And that, as Danny has sort of shown us, that you need to closely monitor the prescribing of cannabis, in the, certainly in the early stages when you initiate treatment. Uh, patients might need to be followed up for a week or two, three weeks. And, and that's actually very difficult for specialists often to, um, to f facilitate. And you only have to look overseas, um, and in most countries where medical cannabis is now legal, um, GPs tend to be the, um, the main prescribers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm just going to focus on pain and some sort of complex symptoms that we, that we obviously um, commonly encounter in, in general practice. So um, pain, a highly unpleasant physical sensation caused by illness or injury. Uh, there's, a, there's a few definitions if, if you look them up. But um, chronic pain is, is, a, is a very common um, problem. Around 20% of the population, 7% have chronic pain that's intense and severely disabling and often needs frequent um, health, um, professional health in care input and medication. And um, they tend to um, see their GP more, more frequently. And about 22% of um, primary care consultations are around the subject of pain. Um, this is just something to highlight the, the cycle of pain, that uh, if it, someone who is suffering with pain, it has a knock-on effect. It may interfere with their sleep and uh, you know, create anxiety, heightened pain response. Uh, they may not exercise as much if there's a, you know, a painful uh, back or, or ankle or leg or something, and that can lead to, to, to a vicious cycle, if you like. There's different types of pain that we, um, that we encounter. Um, inflammatory is a very common cause of pain after injury, but uh, neuropathic pain is also um, something that we, we struggle to, to manage in, in, in general practice and, and even in secondary care. So um, pain is, is difficult to manage often. Um, it's difficult to quantify as well. And as I sort of talked about, it can have a knock on someone's mental health or their interactions with If it is poorly managed in the to um, for someone like um, and I, so it's it's really um, it's really important that we make sure that we're this piece um, is it uh, including uh, codamol, uh, codridamol, for example. And then I've trended, you tend to add in um, either stronger opioids, or you might then think about adding in gabalin, amitriptyline, um, and potentially then you might go on to stronger opioids or patches. And this is really common. You, you know, you, this, is, this is the reality of, of how we're working and how we're prescribing. 
Opioids um, have proven not to be effective for long-term chronic pain, despite the fact that, that they're being prescribed. Um, there's large groups of patients um, who struggle to come off their opioids. The British Pain Society has issued guidelines that suggest that anyone over a dose equivalent of 120 milligrams of morphine, it can be assumed that they're not receptive to opioids and it should be um, cut down or, or stopped. So, um, you know, we have the guidelines, but unfortunately we, um, we're not sticking, we're not adhering to, to the guidelines um, collectively as, as GPs. Um, the opioid prescribing rate has increased despite um, the poor efficacy for non-cancer pain. And uh, we do tend to see this particularly in, in poorer parts of the UK. And, um, um, you know, the, actually, because the scripts are initiated in primary care, then, you know, we, we, we really need to hold uh, the responsibility for this. Um, I don't want to focus too much on the USA, but uh, they're in the grips of an opioid crisis. Many people are dying on a daily basis. And, um, you know, it's, it, I certainly see a trend in the UK that, we've, that we're, we're use, do, using opioids more often perhaps than, than we should be. Um, why are we doing this? I think there's a number of, of good reasons. I think sometimes we feel like we lack um, other options and that perhaps it's unethical to not give someone something if, if they need uh, pain relief. Uh, we're very precious for time. The average GP is seeing 41.5 patient contacts in a day. Um, you know, 10 minute face to face or five minute phone calls, it's very difficult to. Um, you know, to, to take a really deep history and, and sort of optimize medication in that time. And uh, often people are waiting months on end to see a pain specialist. Uh, there's also the expectations from patients. I think sometimes they, they, they think they, they'll get a script and often they, and often they do. Um, neuropathic pain is um, it, it's something I touched upon earlier, but it's, it's, it's a common type of pain and it's quite difficult to manage. So common examples would be where there's been damage to, uh, to nerves that may come as a result of perhaps someone who's had a back injury or uh, diabetics, so diabetic neuropathies, um, MS, post-stroke, uh, for example. And um, again, we, you know, we're using the same types of medications to, to manage neuropathic pain. Um, what I've done is I've, I've sort of found some, just some Cochrane reviews, some large studies that are looking at the evidence for, for what we're currently prescribing. So amitriptyline, um, not particularly good evidence that this works well for neuropathic pain, but it's prescribed very commonly. Uh, the same with tramadol. Uh, these, are, these are large studies, um, systematic reviews, low quality evidence that oral, oral tramadol has an important beneficial effect on pain, um, neuropathic pain. Uh, the same with gabapentin. Um, as a result, the gabapentin and pregabalin have actually just been moved to uh, schedule three drug. There was a, um, a nice article recently in the BMJ, which um, uh, is a very large study, and uh, they they just found associations with um, adverse effects. It's um, the many of these medications now have a high street value. Uh, they're used in prison populations um, and uh, for high levels of misuse as well. Yet they're very easily obtainable from from GPs. So um, this this is also true with. Uh, codeine and paracetamol for neuropathic pain, they, these aren't effective medications. Um, the, uh, the evidence from the, this large USA uh, American study su suggests that there is evidence for chronic pain. I don't want to, um, to sort of say that this is the answer to everything because I don't think it is. I think it's absolutely appropriate to be prescribing all of the other medications that I've, I've mentioned, but I just think that this is perhaps another tool in our box, if you like, that it, it can fit in somewhere to, to, to uh, medical management of, of some of these um, the, uh, patients who are, who are suffering with pain. So obviously some studies have very small population sizes or they've not been through RCTs, but there's a gathering body of evidence that, that, um, that cannabis could, could be useful for certain patients, certain conditions. Um, complex conditions, as Danny touched upon, often as GPs we end up with these types of problems and patients. Um, they may have seen specialists or pain clinics, but um, day to day they, they present to us. Uh, notoriously can be difficult to, to manage. Um, and there is no question that there's a degree of overlap between um, uh, fibromyalgia and sometimes um, migraines and IBS sort of symptoms. 
difficult to diagnose and also, um, you know, they're often very subjective and, um, and, and variety. Patients respond differently to different types of medications. Uh, this is, sorry, a little bit of repetition here, but um, th there's basically I'm uh, highlighting the fact that there's an overlap and, uh, you know, I think there's a role for um, cannabis with this, these types of symptoms. Um, it's useful to think about cannabis as a treatment for migraines um, up until fairly recently, and also that um, there's that we already know that the um, that there's sort of subtle interactions between the endocannabinoid system and the and gut motility, which which could um, have sort of profound uh, benefits for patients with IBS. Uh, this was a recent study from Israel. It was a large um, study, and um, it's worth actually uh, looking out. It's really interesting, but uh, they've shown that medical cannabis is a safe and effective treatment for fibromyalgia symptoms. I think this is a point I really want to focus on as a, as a doctor and just as a human being in that, you know, we, we find ourselves often face to face with patients who, who are suffering um, and they may have tried every, every possible type of treatment. Uh, we see the effect it has on their family members or, um, you know, um, and, and I think this is particularly relevant for patients with, I've, highlighted here neurodegenerative conditions or end of life care. I think, you know, we, we should try and think outside the box sometimes. And uh, if anyone's suffering, I think, you know, I'd like to think that we could perhaps offer as much as we, as we could. Um, unfortunately, the situation is, is, is that we can't obtain these types of medications at the moment. And um, some families are having to travel overseas for, um, for, for scripts, uh, which obviously uh, is very expensive, not only financial costs, but great, um, you know, it's very distressing for families when they get stopped at airports and so on. Uh, polypharmacy is, is a big problem in the NHS. It's becoming the norm rather than, than the exception. And uh, there's an awful lot of waste, awful lot of money wasted, awful lot of medications wasted as well, prone to error. Uh, there was a Scottish study, it's a little bit out of date now, but it suggests around 6% of adults are, 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 are taking over 10, 10 drugs in total, and uh, that over um, estimated 300 million pounds of NHS prescribed medicines are wasted each year. Why are, we, why are we working like this? I think there's a lot of reasons. It's a difficult question to answer, but the population is not getting any younger, so people do um, unfortunately um, develop, complicate, you know, hypertension, diabetes, and so on, but we've very much programmed to have a sort of disease-specific approach to prescribing. I think there's a desire to eliminate risk. So um, as prescribers, we, you know, we feel like we, we should be giving certain medications if they fit certain criteria. And I think this is actually the result of um, possibly a side effect of evidence-based medicine. The, this is just a little bit of information about the NHS bill and the, the fact that we're spending money year on year. There's interesting um, evidence now, and even just from hearing what Danny's experience in Canada, actually introducing cannabis, you can, um, you can potentially de-prescribe for, for some patients. Um, they've seen this in the USA where there's a 25% reduction in opioid prescriptions in certain areas. Um, so, so it's just something to think about in the long run that actually the health economics could, could be very, very positive. Uh, this also applies to um, patients that are being admitted regularly to hospitals, perhaps with poorly controlled epilepsy. Um, and then we, we could also think about the, the greater good for the economy if the UK developed its own sort of um, cannabis industry, if you like. Um, cannabis, if it's going to be used for medical purposes at the moment, is uh, putting aside Sativex and um, Epidiolex would be prescribed off license. It's understandable why doctors have concerns about prescribing off license, but it's useful to think about the fact that we regularly do prescribe off license even without knowing it at times. So um, amitriptyline for neuropathic pain is unlicensed, for example, and um, you know, as is geloxetine for fibromyalgia. There's a long list, um, you, could, you, know, you can look it up. It's e easy to find these types of medications, but there's, there's quite a few, and um, even ones that I've prescribed and I not realized they're actually being used off license. That, this applies particularly to pediatric medications. Most of them haven't, a lot of, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think most haven't been through RCTs because they're, they're, it's um, difficult to do studies in pediatric um, populations. And also, 
it's interesting to think that as doctors and prescribers, there's a lot of variation even between local CCGs. So one GP may be prescribing one drug first line for something, whereas a few miles down the road, they'd be using something else for the same condition. Um, I think cannabis medicine is very much in this space of patient-centered care. This is um, a really sort of important area when you think about how to treat patients that you should be including them in the decision making. Um, it would, you work in partnership with your, with your patient. Um, I think it would be, it's totally appropriate for cannabis medicine that um, someone is informed of the, the levels of evidence and uh, that they make an informed decision collect collectively with the prescriber as, as to whether they would like to, to, uh, uh, to, to try treatment. Um, and I think that requires a, a shift in attitude as well. Um, you know, that I think this at the moment sits in a, an interesting space in that it um, it's perhaps takes a slightly more creative approach to, to treating, treating a patient. Um, and it, at the moment, I don't think it necessarily fits um, well into the, how we're, you know, we're working day to day, but I think that will only develop in time and, I, and, uh, and it will become more mainstream. Treat your patients as you would want your, your family or yourself to be treated. This is something that I've just heard numerous doctors say to me over the years, and I, I certainly would, wouldn't rule this out for myself, God forbid, or a family member or someone who was suffering. And, uh, and I think that's really the, the key point for me, that um, you know, we, we, we need to embrace it and learn more and more. Education is obviously the, um, you know, the uh, very, very important. Um, we've got the Academy now of Medical Cannabis. Um, I think this needs to be a top priority, and, uh, and I would encourage medical schools to, to get behind this. Um, I think it's really important that GPs also um, develop their understanding of, of cannabis medicine so they can have informed conversations with, with their patients. Um, it would be fantastic if some of the, inst the medical institutions got behind a sort of CPD accredited teaching program so that, um, you know, that we can set really high standards really early on. Um, I think we've got a unique chance to get this right in the UK. And uh, you know, I think we, we could all work collectively to, to, to do that. Um, global trends, it's, you know, there's a lot of hype here in the UK at the moment, but this is, it's not that new in a way. This is, this is being used all over the world. Every week, another country opens up the doors to legalization for medical use. Um, it's becoming part of the global landscape. GPs are commonly prescribing in, in most other countries. Germany is an interesting example because they only recently um, legalized cannabis for medical use, and they've already issued um, 142,000 scripts, um, uh, I think, within the first year. And the, the demand for, for good medical products currently outstrips supply of, of high-grade um, high products. Closing thoughts. I think there's clearly a need for this. Um, I think we need to be realistic about what could be achieved with, with medical cannabis. I think it's a, it could be a very useful adjunct or add-on therapy for, for some patients. Um, and I, th I think we need to emphasize it's not a cure for, um, uh, but a useful um, tool for symptom relief. It does have a good safety profile, uh, which is why I'm sort of happy to put my name to it. I feel it's something that we should all feel confident in, in um, in, in using, and uh, I think GPs have unnecessarily been sort of left out of the conversation, uh, particularly um, because of the, the, the recent legislation. And I would I would hope that perhaps the government would would um, would think about that as well. I think we're restricting the a pool of prescribers as well. <coughs> Discoveries are now happening at an unprecedented rate. If you look on PubMed, there's um, there's a huge boom in studies across the world. Um, there is a, clearly a need for for more data, more trials. Um, Mike spoke briefly about this earlier, but I think most of the evidence will come from prospective observational studies. We need to remove the stigma of medical cannabis. And I also think we need to separate this um, conversation between recreational use and uh, medicinal use. And I think in time, I, I could imagine a system where we have either specialist cannabis prescribers or doctors who have a special interest who are seeing a pool, this pool of patients. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna open things up by asking the doctors a brief introductory question, hopefully give you a moment to uh, warm your minds up. I think um, 
we've had a picture painted today, which is that uh, there's a huge amount of potential here. There are challenges which need to be confronted along the lines of uh, more randomized control trials, more education. Um, I think it's incredibly important for any clinician, but we'll focus on the UK for now, to understand that this is going in the direction it's going. We are going to be looking at a landscape in a year or two, or in the medium term, in which the inquiries are going to be frequent, and doctors are going to need to have some kind of literacy in this area, and certainly you know, more of an education than exists today. So I was hoping you might be able to indicate what you think are the most important considerations for practicing clinicians in the medium term, say a year or two from now. So it's a, it's a really good question. So, you know, speaking from my experience from Canada and then seeing how things are developing in the UK, I think education is first and foremost, which is, you know, the goal of the academy. And, you know, really what it comes down to is we never learned about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. And even in Canada, where, you know, I went, I was in medical school 15 years ago, I've been practicing for 10 years, and even 15 years ago, we had medical cannabis in Canada. It was legal. I didn't even know that was a possibility, and I didn't learn about it. So I think education, 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 and then research studies, we may not ever get our CTs, but if we can start combining education and working with institutions um, and doing observational, really good observational studies, then this is going to go a long, long way. Yeah, I think um, obviously education is, is the key, but the um, my, my view on it is that doctors like guidelines. So we, you know, we <laughs> the, it's just how, we, how we're trained often that we follow n either nice guidelines or f um, flow charts. So... I would I would like to see sort of standardized treatments initially that doctors can follow from a practical point of view. I think um, platforms like the um, Academy of Medical Cannabis have, uh, uh, seem to be the only type of learning platform at the moment. Um, but there's no reason why uh, you know we we can work with other groups or um, government bodies such as Nice, for example, to collaborate. And uh, I think it would be great to have a sort of um, a, a platform that's um, very sort of high in high level content and actually one observation from overseas is that they they often don't exist elsewhere either so um so you know um, if you go to Canada or I've just come back from Israel they don't have uh, there are documents that have been produced for doctors but it's a bit messy actually and I, that's why I think we've got a really good opportunity here to get get things right so um, yeah Mike what are your thoughts yeah, um, guidelines are useful. Um, the trouble is we've got rubbish guidelines. Um, the, in fairness, we, what we haven't mentioned, we should have mentioned, is the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society has produced its own guidelines, uh, which are very reasonable, highly balanced, because we wrote them. Um, uh, and that I think they produce a sort of counterbalance to the rather negative RCP, BPNA guidelines, and they're helpful. I wouldn't hold your breath for NICE. A lot of doctors are hiding, but we can't do this before NICE comes out. NICE, I guarantee, will be negative, cautious. They will say there's a lot of interest in this, uh, but we need much more study, so we'll prescribe it to them. I could write it for them, because um, they haven't asked people to know what they're talking about. And so we're wasting our time waiting for NICE. Um, NICE will not be of any use to anybody. Um, having said that, uh, I think guidelines are helpful. More guidelines from other people. Uh, uh, as long as they're reasonable and balanced and look at the evidence and it's all education and reassuring doctors who are scared of it uh, that actually it's not something to be scared about. And it's, a, it's maybe a, a strange thing to say to non-doctors in the audience, but even if you've messed it up completely, you're not going to kill anybody. And that's actually quite important. Doctors do get concerned that if I mess this up, I might kill somebody and you're not going to kill anyone with cannabis. And that's a, that is, it may sound extreme to non-doctors in the audience, but that is actually remarkably reassuring. There's a lot of trial and error, a lot of guesswork in cannabis medicine, uh, but you're not going to completely balls it up. OK. Thank you very much. Um, I will take so, some questions now. Oh, we should also mention that uh, we are happy to distribute the slides to anyone who would be interested in that afterwards. So here we go. Um, a question in two parts, if I may, sort of related to that, uh, Dr. Barnes, uh, Professor Barnes, you said there was a million people who took 
uh, kind of pro probably need for another half a million. W where do these numbers come from and who are these people? What do they do? They have it in their back garden. They talk to you. They talk to... How does it happen? That's a lot of people. And the second question is uh, the German model um, of basically state monopoly that gives the licenses and creates the demand, controls the prices, and enables the prescription. Is that something that's thought about here uh, instead of waiting for NICE to give its verdict? Those numbers come from, I think it was an anti patients Alliance that came up with those numbers. It's difficult to, to know for certain because by definition it's difficult to find out um, and how many people would use it if it, uh, if it was legally available is, is guesswork. But we can only extrapolate from the percentage using it in other populations and my guess is there's been one and a half to two million people in this country. Where people are getting it from, they're getting it from a number of some very, very good people in this country who are producing high quality product. Uh, albeit uh, illegally, or there's some producing high CBD product, which is legal, but has slightly less medical efficacy. There are people in the audience who, who uh, uh, supply these products. Do you want to talk about it, or do you want to make any comment? Callie up the back there. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the people in this country that is currently supplying people with illegal cannabis oils um, as safely and as clinically as I possibly can in an illegal market. Um, I get everything tested in a lab. I do everything, as, as, you know, as I said, as clinically as I can. Um, I, I'm not sure the numbers of people using cannabis in this country. I, 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 the last I heard, it was actually 5 million people, probably about that, that, that are using cannabis in this country every day. Um, many of them are going and finding it in, on, on the uncontrolled market. And unfortunately, because of prohibition, we're probably two of a handful of people that are actually testing oils and making sure we know what's in them. The rest is... Pfft, who knows? Trial and error, as you say. But um, yeah, the thing is, with error, at least you can't kill anybody, like Mike said. Um, but yeah, there, there are many people in this country that are producing for people while they wait for the guidelines, while they wait for everybody else to get their ducks lined up in a row and, and things like that. So there is an underground um, element in this country who do care. There are many caregivers in this country. Um, well, I have the mic, you guys. <laughs> Bearing in mind the current situation with uh, provisions, the cost of good quality cannabis medicine, um, the lack of training uh, for GPs and medical specialists, um, and the nuances within cannabinoid profiling within the different strains and the fact that the big pharma companies are probably going to provide maybe eight to ten strains, would um, dispensaries for one part be an option to provide a service in the UK? And secondly, would the NHS be uh, the, open to the panel, of course, would the NHS be willing to consider a grow your own option as a prescription for cannabis medicine? Mm -hmm. And um, with the um, keeping of a diary from a very subjective point of view, um, maybe that would be a way to kind of um, deal with the attention that's needed when introducing cannabis medicine. And a lot of the um, insecurity around that is because of the prohibition, actually. I think if a doctor was saying, take this three times a day, people would feel a lot less worried. They're on the back foot at the moment because they're taking illegal oils. And so, there you go. I think that's what's called the run-on question. But, but no, they're great questions. So I can speak from the Canadian experience. So two things. So dispensaries, we've had dispensaries in Canada for many, many years. And it's a double-edged sword with dispensaries because I, I get a lot of referrals from patients who have gone to a dispensary and a very well-meaning teenager has gone to my 80-year-old patient with arthritis. I think this would be great for you. Or my patient shows up with a neurological disorder and the very well-meaning, uh, you know, not, not medically trained person behind the counter is going, oh my gosh, like I don't know what to get this person. And they do generally want to help. So sometimes they get the wrong product. Uh, a lot of times dispensary products are in Canada at least weren't tested by Health Canada. Um, a lot of black market products, again, you know, speaking to what you're just saying, 
uh, Callie, they're not tested, so you're testing your products, but you know, products that are not tested, they often spray it with a synthetic cannabinoid called spice, and that binds to the CB1 receptors differently in the brain and potentially has a higher risk of psychosis. So these are all kind of issues. Um, in Canada, I have prescribed Grow Own through the Health Canada License Program for some of my patients. It's generally not my first line option because it's hard to grow your own. Um, some of my patients seemed really gun ho in the beginning, and then you know it just kind of fizzles <coughs> out because it's it's a, almost a full time job growing cannabis, especially in Canada. Um, it's cold in Canada most of the year. Uh, however, I have a few patients, you know, a handful of my patients who they couldn't afford even the licensed producer oils in Canada, which are actually quite inexpensive now. Um, and they lived out in the rural countryside. They were retired. They were already quite botanically inclined and they had big gardens. And I helped them choose the seeds so we kind of knew what they were growing. And it worked really well for them, actually. But, you know, it's a bit of more of a guessing game because every batch of oil or edibles that they make is going to be slightly different. Um, but I, I certainly think for some people it might be a, a great option. Um, but potentially more trial and error. And I, I think it's something that most doctors are not comfortable with. So I think that might be something maybe through a different legislative pathway that in the future potentially, so people can still go to their doctor and get the, you know, the monographed um, pharmaceutical oils from medical cannabis companies. And then maybe there's a different way through legislation of having someone be able to grow, I don't know, up to, um, I let my patients grow up to seven to 10 plants, basically. And, you know, some of my colleagues say, well, what if they're diverting it? Well, I mean, sh they're probably not because I'm monitoring them and I do video consults and I look at their plants and it's, it's actually quite interactive. Um, and these are quite, you know, just normal people. These aren't criminals. These are just normal Canadians just kind of trying to live their life and get medicine that they need. Um, so I think it's the, the fear about diversion when you're growing a small grow own is probably uh, overinflated, but it, it is something we have to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have a huge amount to say on it, uh, on your specific question, but I th my thoughts are that this should be available widely throughout the NH NHS, however that's implemented. Um, I don't think patients should be picking up the cost of, of this treatment. Um, I, th I think initially, well, I think it should be reserved for uh, the um, a smaller, uh, you know, a, a specific group of patients uh, who have who have not responded well to other other measures, conventional measures, and uh, I, I think it, it's it's quite hard to predict how it's all going to um, um, develop. But um, quite clearly, at the moment, pa patients are struggling to access anything through the NHS, which is why. Um, the private space is is more active, um, but um, you know I'd like to see. Uh, um, I don't want personally wouldn't want to see a two tiered system. I think we should, GPs in primary care in NHS practices should should be able to prescribe if they're given the right tools to do that. Yeah, well, I, I basically agree with all that. Um, I, what I like to see is just cannabis for medical purposes available to everyone who needs it, and I don't really care how that happens. I can see in the short term um, the political benefit of medicalizing it, but there's a slight illogicality to that in that the doctors uh, don't really know what they're doing. Uh, so why do we exclude the people who do know what they're doing? And there's some extremely knowledgeable people out there who've been growing it, albeit illegally, for a long time, and we should, we should use that knowledge. Um, so I think in the short term, to get it politically through, it's been right to make it a, a medical type of product. I would like to see that opened up as fast as possible to GPs, as we talked about, both private and NHS particularly. I'd like to see that the Canadian model of uh, dispensaries with very knowledgeable people, called, they call them bud tenders in, um, in uh, Canada, I think it's a great, great concept. I think grow your own for a small number of people is, is the right thing to do as well. And I just like to see it opened up so that everyone who needs it can benefit from it and get it in the way that is right for them, basically. Um, so I think this one is for Danny. Um, you, you touched in your examples upon this kind of strain is good for this type of condition, this profile needs to be administered. Is there any information sharing going on around that or is it really just your dark art and experience that is currently driving this? Or, For example, you, you mentioned that um, CBD is good for psychosis and 
here in the UK, we just hear constantly that cannabis use leads to psychosis. And I wondered if you could answer what, what is the evidence behind that and how are we actually pooling this, this information around what helps what kind of condition? So I'm going to tackle the second part first, so the psychosis. So first of all, I think it's really important that we just don't dismiss this, this fear about psychosis because in a very small number of people with a genetic predisposition, with the right circumstance, with very, very high THC, recreational smoke cannabis, potentially it, it might increase the risk of, of converting to a psychotic episode. But it's only a very small percentage of people. And is it the... THC or is it other synthetic cannabinoids that are increasing that risk? We just don't know because the data has come from recreational use studies. It's very different than what I prescribe medically. However, the risk, uh, the small risk of psychosis in, in predisposed individuals is with T THC. So CBD has been trialed in a few small to medium studies, a few that have been blinded and placebo controlled against antipsychotic agents. And it's performed as well as one of the other uh, very regularly used antipsychotic agents. So we, we know actually that it does have antipsychotic effects. So even for someone with a history of psychosis, a CBD product with you know trace THC is actually very safe. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is, is it my own dark art? No, so I'm on a, a group of, of doctors in Canada and a few from the US actually um, who all do medical cannabis work. And we all have our slightly different approaches, but we're always sharing information about cases. And there's also you know, online non-doctor resources like Leafly, um, MJ Brake, who have kind of just basically pooled data from patients' use over time about what strains have been used for different things. And because I do have a background in herbal medicine as well, I tend to uh, get very interested in those types of things. So I'm probably digging deeper than the average medical cannabis doctor, but it is something that's possible to teach to teach other people. It's not something, you know, you have to go through a fellowship in herbal medicine to understand it. It's all teachable information. And I think we have to remember as physicians, we all go through, you know, over a decade of training. It's possible to teach this to doctors. And here in the UK, I've started to train doctors for the first clinics. And, you know, I give them basically a crash course in herbal medicine just so they can understand. And initially it's a bit, you know, I remember when I first went to my first herbal medicine lecture uh, almost 10 years ago, and, you know, it kind of blows your mind because you're told that the same herb can have what's called an agonist and antagonist effect at the same receptor site. And in English, this means it can have the opposite effect in the brain at different, different doses. And that doesn't really happen in the same way with most drugs. So it kind of blew my mind. Um, but after you kind of explain the science behind it, it has its own science. Herbal medicine has a science. Um, it's just not an RCT-led science. So I, I think it is possible to be more specific as we get more products. And in, in the beginning, you know, you don't have much choice uh, for products. So it'll be simple, THC, CBD. And then as we get more products available in the UK, then we can get fancier. Very quick statistic, the paper by Hickman showed, uh, I think it was 18,000, you had to stop 18,000 heavy male users of cannabis, that street cannabis, uh, from smoking uh, to prevent one episode of psychosis, and it was 29,000 female users. I think that puts it into context. We have to take that seriously. I wouldn't prescribe for an active um, person with a psychotic, ongoing psychotic episode, but you know, that it's not a massive risk and the risk is virtually negligible in medical um, uses because of the CBD component. So we should, shouldn't forget that. Hi, um, my name is Sagar. Um, you just spoke about the herbal side. Um, so I come from herbal holistic medicine side as well and obviously my sort of heritage is in Indian medicine as well like traditionally. Um, so when I see all this CBD stuff and I also see for the last 10-15 years the THMPD laws which is basically saying in Europe that you can't use all these Indian and African herbs because I've been in the UK since before the 1990s um, and then I see the 
for the last two years I'm learning about cannabis and CBD's got to be isolated and separated. That's just like, none of that makes sense to me because from an Indian perspective or a Chinese or Oriental perspective, um, you wouldn't tear it apart unless you've got some specific stuff going on and even when you tear it apart, then you would actually isolate and you would actually match it or you'd mix it with some ashwagandha or some other herbs. Um, but when I actually do see this happening, then I see, is this a pathway for companies who've got the money and the finance to actually pay the MHRA for the laws and regulations to say, well, this is my own variation of CBD? Or is it a case that um, cannabis CBD should actually be free in terms like, it, sh it shouldn't be at the behest of the companies who've got the most amount of money to put the most amount of money to do the research. And that, that's one question. And the other question is that in terms of when I see the front runners in cannabis, it's mostly like Israel and the US and Canada. But where are the Indians and the Chinese? Um, well, I've gone to TCM conferences and I said about cannabis and the, the Chinese medical professors, the, the t they're, they're laughing their faces off at me like they've already got stoned. And I was like, this is your culture, 3,000 years before Christ. What are you guys doing? Where's the Indians? Where's the Thai? Where's so is there any reflection on that? And also the government a few years ago actually said that any company that wants to patent turmeric, they're not going to be able to. They can't patent the herb. And in the same light, is the Indian government taking any steps to protect the sovereignty of the plant as well? Because I think that's really important. Thank you. Western medicine doctor, and I practice Western medicine. I also am trained in herbal medicine. So it's true. When you when you take away one chemical, oh, I, right, I have this now. <laughs> I can stop yelling. Um, when you take away one chemical from hundreds or thousands in a, in, a, in a plant, it doesn't have what's called herbal synergy, which is what you rely on in herbal medicine. But it is also true that you know we're going to see pharmaceutical drugs made from cannabis compounds. It's inevitable. This is going to be a multi-billion-dollar industry. Um, there's nothing we can do to stop that. But you know I do think that the whole herb does have better effects than isolating one component at a time. I have many patients who have tried uh, nabilone or sesame, you know, the synthetic THC, and they have really bad side effects. And then they come to me, and I put them on a whole herbal extract along with THC, which a lot of them are very hesitant, uh, you know, in the beginning to try, and they do just fine. So, uh, I guess that's the first question. Second question is, uh, do I combine it with other herbals? I do because I practice integrated medicine. Um, you know, and you can combine it with other herbals and get sometimes a nicer response. And that's just the nice thing about herbal synergy. You can combine uh, more herbs at lower doses and get a nice response. But it's very, it's, it's an art form. Um, where are the Indians and the Chinese? Well, in China, it's a highly regulated industry still. So it, they're just starting to give out cultivation licenses for only CBD. And even the seed banks are controlled. In India, it's still illegal. But if, um, you know, as you know, you probably spent lots of time in India as well. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in India doing sabbaticals for, you know, studying Ayurveda, uh, Indian medicine and meditation. And, you know, when you go into the villages, there's a lot of traditional use of bang, which is basically a cannabis paste ground up with ghee or butter, a part of butter. Um, and they use it for lots of different purposes, medicinal, recreational, spiritual. So it's still a part of the culture. And I think, you know, we don't really know what's gonna happen with the Indian government. I suspect they're going to legalize it um, medically. But, you know, I, I can't give you any guarantees. Um, what was the last part? Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. I think it's a it's a good point. It's a bigger discussion. I think is do you want to? I think we might have to move on. Apologies. I think um, we perhaps have time for one more question. Actually, I haven't just done a quick time check. I think 
with regards to uh, matters of legalization, you always want to be just incredibly uh, aware of any legal framework and uh, not be too worried about semantics. Um, so I've got a similar question, and it's basically regarding the following. So I work in Africa with communities um, in different parts of Africa who have worked with this herb for a really long time medicinally. So what is the importance of the indigenous knowledge system surrounding this herb in the medicinal industry and going forward? Because I feel that there is a huge importance of them, and it's totally not acknowledged because, I don't know, there's... No scientific fact, although there's you know more than enough evidence. What is your opinion on how going forward, also as medical practitioners, can you, you know, utilize and make space for that indigenous knowledge that's really widely available? I think it's a great point. You know, a lot of traditions use herbs not for its purpose, I think for thousands of years, and it went for body's traditional use that should be part of the modern evidence-based framework because it, it's real life use over thousands of years, as Mike has said, that these things are probably quite safe. Um, it's not just cannabis. Like we see most of our, a lot of our medicines have come from plants, like cancer therapies, um, heart medications have all come from plants that have been used traditionally. Um, but sometimes it's hard to integrate that into a modern medicine framework. I, I think it should happen, but I think that's, that's more difficult. Um, potentially putting more curriculum around traditional use medicines into medical school curriculum might be a way to kind of um, have the new doctors thinking a little bit differently, a little bit more open-mindedly. Yep. I agree. I, mean, I think it's a matter of, of trying to involve a lot of other data. We, we shouldn't be obsessed about um, modern Western medicine data, because I said earlier, this has been used for 3,000 years. There's a huge amount of experience of how to use it in China, in India, in Africa, uh, in different cultures like the Rastafarian culture. There's an awful lot of people who know what they're doing with this, and we shouldn't dismiss that, or because they haven't undergone a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Um, so that I think we do need to be a little bit more open-minded in Western medicine about accepting um, evidence from other cultures who've got many, many hundreds of years of experience. So I, I agree with you entirely. The trouble is that's not published, and so we need to get it accessible. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, if, if there's some way of getting hold of that uh, knowledge, then we should use it. I just don't know personally. Perhaps you can tell us but uh, later on, but uh, how do we get hold of that knowledge? Um, so that's all I would say, and I think probably, if I've got the microphone in my hand, I ought to stop because we sold probably at 2.30. Thank you all really very much. I hope that was interesting for you all. Thank you. Go out and enjoy the sunshine, and uh, all the best.